And so, and indeed, you know, while doing my research on Rabbi Kiva, obviously he's one of the names that's most ubiquitous throughout the Talmud and one of the great heroes of the uh, first and second century. Uh, so late, late first, early second century of the Common Era. Uh, and you find that there really is uh, uh, voluminous content about Rabbi Kiva. Uh, so what we're going to do is kind of select highlights, uh, especially ones dealing with kind of his, his, the biographical picture of his life, but also the great kind of lessons and impact that he had and some of the positions that he had that are very, very valuable for us today. So the quick story, we know Rabbi Kiva is the son of converts, and Maimonides uh, points us out again and again. Uh, which I think comes to the come, comes to the idea that um, in in Judaism and especially with regards to Jewish leadership, it's a meritocracy. Someone like Rabbi Akiva, who began his life as you know a simpleton and ignoramus, someone he's described as an amaris, someone who knows not a lot of Torah. We'll see a little bit about how that changed, of course. Um, the son of a convert, kind of a you know like a pariah, like an outsider, so to speak. Uh, yet he rises all the way to the top, so much so that Moses, in, pro- in prophecy, able, is able to foresee Rabbi Kiva and says to God, why don't you give the Torah with Rabbi Kiva? Why are you giving him the Torah through me? That, that's the kind of levels that, 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 he, that he reached. Uh, became, obviously, the greatest scholar of his time and also one of the most crucial individuals with regards to uh, transmitting the Torah to the next generation. You know, he was at a time where there was a lot of uh, chaos, a lot of difficulty, a lot of restrictions on Torah study, um, and, and he was the one, more than anyone else in his time, who rallied the people and, 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 and taught the Torah uh, under tremendous duress. What was his um, religious background as to how he was saved? You said he was okay, so, let's, so let's, let's start a little bit with his background. So the, now what we're going to do is we're selecting from the Talmud. The Talmud uh, spends a lot of time with him, which is a little bit atypical. Talmud's a book of law. Uh, atypically, it spends a lot of time with Rabbi Tiva talking about his biography. So we're going to select uh, pieces, and, um, and that will hopefully paint a, a complete picture. Uh, so the per, uh, number one is his background, and he tells us, this is him himself, once he's already a Torah scholar, and he tells the students as follows, and I mentioned this recently, he says, when I was an Amaretz, when I was an ignoramus, I'm a, I'm a, ignoramus is not the correct translation, um, um, but uh, it's, it's a term of someone who is not only uh, ignorant in Torah matters, but also spiteful. And he says, when I was an Amaretz, I would say, if only someone could present me with a Torah scholar, and I'll bite him like a donkey. And his students say to him, wait a minute, you bite, bite him. You bite him like a dog, not like a donkey. He says, no, 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 no. When a dog bites, it bites and doesn't break bones. When a donkey bites, it bites and breaks bones. It breaks bones. He had such... Well, okay, but he had such... Let's, let's, let's try to do the simple first, right? He had such animosity towards the Torah scholars that, uh, that he just, just wanted to break... It wasn't enough to just bite. He wanted to break bones. Now, I think... You know, in our class, every time we hear the word donkey or chamor, it just send off kind of alarm bells. Because uh, if y'all remember, we talked about this several times, the whole idea of chamor, of a donkey in, in Jewish philosophy, is that it represents the most simple, the most basic of, of, of life forms. Uh, like, the, the, you know, the donkey doesn't have much going on upstairs. Uh, and we have the images of Abraham and Moses and Messiah all riding on top of a donkey in total control of their body and, and their physicality. And Rabbi Kiva says, when I was a Amaretz, I wanted to bite him like a donkey. So yes, he explains, well, break bones. But there's also a lesson, and I found something very fascinating last night, and even though this is a little bit atypical of what I like to teach, um, I found something very interesting about this. So he, he wants to be like a donkey, who breaks bones. And of course, he became a Torah scholar, and he became one of them, right? Um, but, if y'all remember, when Jacob's about to die, he's giving his blessings to his kids. And there's one of his sons, by his name, the name of Yisachar, <coughs> right? Or Issachar. And Yisachar, he tells him, you're like a donkey. And of course, if your dad tells you you're a donkey, 
Maybe it's not a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> All right? But in this case, incidentally, it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a compliment. And you tell them you're a donkey. And why? Because a donkey, what it does, all it does is carry its load. And Yisachar represents the great Torah scholar whose entire life is dedicated towards carrying Torah. A tremendous mass of Torah and being totally dedicated to that pursuit. And I saw one of the commentators say something very fascinating. He says, Rabbi Kiva was a donkey. He started off as being a kind of the simple, that was his focus. And then he, he morphed into this, the, the idea of someone who's entirely dedicated to Torah study. As if he negated the fact that, you know, he, he changed his perspective from the donkey being the focus of his existence to being just merely the tool that he's using towards his pursuit of Torah. Then he says something interesting. This to me was like a nice little bow on top. He says that the Hebrew word for biting is nishicha. And the Hebrew word for kissing is nishika. The only difference is one is a chaf and one is a kuf. And if you do the gematria, which I know this is, sounds like, whoa, rabbi, we're always teaching gematrias. If you do the gematria, the difference between a kuf and a chaf is 80. So he says, for 40 years we know Rabbi Akiva, he wanted to bite the Torah scholars. And for the next 80 years, because he died at the age of 120, and the Talmud goes to point out that Moses died at 120, and Rabbi Tiva died at 120, and that's not one of the only parallels between the two. And that, that slight difference tells us that for the next 80 years of his life, he was enraptured in love with Torah. I thought that was so cool. Um, romantic at heart. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, to me, this is interesting, because Rabbi Tiva is someone... You know, who's one of the most transformative individuals in all of human history, right? Certainly in Jewish history. Um, and he starts off his life with this just very bizarre hatred. Even people that are ignorant uh, to Torah, they don't necessarily have a hatred. I think the fact that he had this hatred, uh, perhaps it was a certain pining to be like that. But that kind of, that, that, that kind of you know, uh, Opens it up an insight, opens up a door of understanding of what he was like, and you know, is it possible that if he didn't have that hatred, maybe he wouldn't have that same desire as well once he kind of changed his course? Yeah, this deepest envy of wanting to be like them, and that causes him to end it. You know, his parents maybe. Were converts. Well, we know his dad was a convert. I mean, maybe there was some rebellion early on. Yeah. So we. Yeah. Right. So we don't know so much. But this is one one uh, one story we find. Now, so we say we think of someone who wants to buy Torah scholars as being someone you know who doesn't necessarily have the highest character. You know what you say? You know, if someone's gonna bite the Torah scholars, it doesn't seem like he's of the. You know, he's not the kind of guy you want to have a beer with or want to be friend with. <laughs> friendly with. Huh. <laughs> But what's actually remarkable is that we find other, ins- other stories of Rabbi Kiva before he became uh, interested in Torah that show, that show that he had incredible character, the highest level of, of, of ethics and behavior and the unimaginable. I'll give you guys a few stories here. Um, it tells a story of when he was a... So he was a shepherd, and he was hired by um, an individual whose name was Rabbi Eliezer, <laughs> who eventually became his Torah teacher as well. And he was working for him in the south for three years. This is the Talmud and Shabbos, 127. And after three years, on the eve of Yom Kippur, he says to him, okay, I worked for you for three years, pay me. So what does the guy tell him? Sorry, I don't have any money, can't pay you. Now, Rebelez was one of the great, was one of the wealthiest people around. Right? You imagine you worked for three years, and your boss is, lives in a mansion, and he has a chauffeur, and butlers, and... and I Such torn wall wants to pay pay everyone every night. Well, okay, but maybe if you're hired for a certain amount of time, that's that's fine. It's not that's more kind of like a 1099 versus a W two. The 1099 guy you pay every night. Um, and so Rabbi is like, I, I don't I don't have any money. So Akiva then says, Okay, you don't have any money. Give me fruits. Give me fruits. What, three years fruits. He says, I don't have any fruits. Uh, give me land. You know, one of the biggest landowners. Give me land. Pay me with land. I'll, pay, I'll be fine with that. I don't have that. Give me animals, livestock. I don't have that. 
I'm out. Sorry, I'm out. Uh, give me linens and, and, and kind of um, 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 fabric that I could sell. I don't have that either. So what does he do? He's dejected. He's disappointed. And he just goes, 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 goes back home, empty-handed. Can you imagine? After, after three years of working for someone, and the guy looks like he's living in, you know, he's one of the wealthiest people around. And sorry, you're out of luck, right? What are you going to do? So he goes, he goes home. And then after Sukkot, so this is before him here, but after Sukkot, the, uh, the boss comes, and he has all his money, and he also brings three donkeys, just, I don't know what the, okay, three donkeys. One of them had lots of food, one of them lots of drink, and one of them lots of goodies. And he goes to Rabbi Kiva's house, and after they ate and drank, and he gave him his payment, he said to him, what did you think when I was telling you this? Right? I said, you asked for money, fair, you work, you want to get paid. And what did you suspect? I said, well, I suspected, this is Rabbi Kiva's fine, I suspected that maybe you had some sort of really cheap business, that you were, uh, that you know, that you were um, uh, afforded the opportunity to buy, and it was super cheap, so you just bought it all. That's what I thought. And then when I asked, when I said to you, um, why don't you give me animals? I said, well, maybe your animals are rented to other people. And why don't you give me, why don't you give me land? I said, maybe you have sharecroppers um, that took it. And when I said, why don't you give me fruits? I said, well, maybe your fruits were yet untithed. And when I said. Um, why don't you give me your linens and sheets and all that stuff? I said, well, maybe you donated that to the coffers of the temple. Just assume the best. He, exactly. Just judge favorably. And then Rebellion says, every single word that you said is true. Every single word that you said was true. Everything that you described all happened. That's all true. And he says, the reason why I donated all my other materials to the temple is because of my own son, Hercules, who's, by the way, a different story, a whole story of this, this guy, Hercules, the son of this rebel Yezer. I wanted to donate in order that he should start, study Torah, but then I went to the rabbis and they nullified my, 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 my oath, and here I can pay you everything. And it tells a story. This, and this comes in, incidentally, to tell us the kind of the great measure of, uh, of judging favorably that was present in Rabbi Akiva at that time. And I, I think, like, you know, if you just imagine just the kind of character that that would take to not only kind of not smash the guy in the face, working for three years. Can you imagine what kind of dedication? You're working for three years, and you want to get paid, and it's only fair, and the guy says, sorry, I'm a, I don't have anything. And you're judging favorably every step of the way, uh, which is um, pretty, pretty That's remarkable. How, how foolish that he did wait three years to decide to, to ask for his pay. Well, I think might have worked. Well, there's a lot of questions. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, you know, but I think it's still, you know, it the still allegory, demonstrates yeah. the kind of character that he had. Yeah. No. Okay, so now what happens with Rabbi Kiva? So he, he's someone of a very fine character, and we'll see how that kind of plays into his future development. Um, and maybe there was a motivation to study Torah, but for whatever reason, like there was no, nothing happening, and we know that that wasn't for, you know, nothing happened for forty years. And the Talmud tells us that he had this epiphany at the age of forty that kind of made him change his direction. What happened? He was very famous story. He was uh, by a well, which. Once again, it's very interesting that he's a shepherd by a well, and who do we know is a shepherd by the well? Every great figure in Jewish history. Uh, and by the way, his name, Akiva, it's actually the same letters of Jacob, which is interesting, you know, and we find parallels between the two. And he's by the well, and what he sees something very bizarre. He sees a rock in which there is a hole bored through. And he asks the people, why is there a hole in the rock? And they say to him, look, we see this little drop of water that's hitting the rock. And over, over a long time, the water kind of penetrates the rock. If, if, you know, if you have a drop of water, even if it's only a slight drop, but if it's incessant, it's ceaseless, relentless, it'll eventually you know, bore a hole through the rock. Right away, Rabbi Kiva made this calculation. He says, if the water, which is soft, is able to, uh, to, you know, to make a hole in the rock, which is hard, how much more so can the Torah which is hard like steel, you know, how, make a hole in my heart, or penetrate my heart, which is soft. 
If something soft penetrates something which is hard, certainly something which is hard will penetrate something that is soft. And he was so moved by this experience, he decided <coughs> that if he, it's not too late, and the Torah is so powerful, and it can penetrate his heart, and he went, and he sat, him and his son, and they sat by a teacher, and he said to the teacher, teach me Torah. So we have this image of like Rabbi Akiva at the age of 40, going into kindergarten with all the kids. <laughs> and the Talmud describes here that he was holding the, uh, he's holding the, uh, the, the kind of the board, and they make a picture of an aleph. An aleph. This is an aleph, and this is a bet. And he learns the letters, and eventually he's learning, reading, reading, learning, and learns and learns the whole, the whole written Torah. Um, I kind of have some experience with this a little bit. You know, when I was in Israel, there was um, there was a student uh, who had arrived, was a college student, and he he didn't know how to read Hebrew. He's twenty years old. He'd come to yeshiva, right? To, you don't know how to read Hebrew. You're you're in Israel. And you're in yeshiva, and you can't read it in Hebrew. So I said, okay, well, you have to remedy that. So I actually sat with him and made flashcards. This is an aleph. This is a bed. Like, this is what the letters looked like. Never seen them before. Um, and, you know, the next day he knew the, alf- the alphabet. And I would assume, by the way, we look at Rabbi Kiva, how, how many days did he spend in kindergarten? I assure you it was just one day, you know, because he was one of the great, great geniuses, one of the great minds, of course, uh, in Jewish history. But he started from the floor. That parallel <laughs> really drives me. What? The parallel with the steel toner against the soft heart. And vice, I mean, that, that yeah, by the way, if you... Anybody who could think like that, I mean... Yeah, and, and I want to point out from that, like we see Rabbi Akiva is going to be someone who's very thoughtful, very very mindful, but also like is able to apply what he, what he sees and what he encounters to himself, you know? The most important characteristic for someone to change is self-application. You know, if you have the two guys, the two smokers, right? So one guy's like, uh, "Okay, this is your lung," and the doctor says, "And this is your lung. This is a healthy lung, and this is your lung. And if if you don't quit, you're going to be dead in twelve months." And the guy says, "What are you talking about?" There was a guy in the news a couple of days ago who died at the age of 107, and his secret to life was smoking a pipe and smoking unfiltered, three packs of unfiltered cigarettes every day. It's ridiculous, right? And the other guy really takes it to heart and says, oh, this could happen to me. Like He applies it to himself, and he changes. Or Bikiva saw a hole in a rock. That's what he saw. Uh, and that doesn't seem to be such a, you know, okay, you would see and say, oh, look, the water penetrated it. But he is, a, you know, he his, his quality of taking this insight and turning it into a lesson that forces him to change his life, that is remarkable. That he had already earlier. If you didn't have that mida, that characteristic of self-application, he wouldn't have had this transformation and who knows what where we would have been. It's very possible to say that if Rabbi Kiva didn't have this transformation, none of us would be here. Really. Because he is a link in the Torah transmission chain that is vital and necessary, and had we not had that link, it's very likely that we'd have, we would have disappeared. Which is very interesting to think about it that way. I was under the understanding that it was his wife that talked Yes, to let's get to his wife. Let's get to his wife. Okay, so um, at, at this point in time, Rabbi Kiva is someone who's maybe he has a little bit of a, of a background, of a foundation uh, towards Jewish study, you know, he knows how to read, he knows how to, but he's not in any way, you know, he's not a Torah scholar whatsoever. And he is the shepherd, he's hired by a fellow by the name of Kalba Savua. Kalba Savua is one of the, um, he's um, uh, the financier of the time. Uh, we know that during the times of the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem, there were storage houses of grain and, and wood because of this fellow who was a super wealthy guy, they didn't call the Savua. So he has, obviously, lots of livestock, and Rabbi Tiva is one of his shepherds. And he has a daughter, the daughter's name is Rachel, and this daughter sees him, and she sees that he has tremendous character, and he's very modest. And she asks him, he says, I will marry you, provided that you pledge to go to yeshiva, to go to study. 
to dedicate your life towards towards Torah study. So they get engaged. They don't get married. He goes off to study, and then her dad finds out what happens, and she said, "This is absolutely you. You're gonna you're betrothed <coughs> to one of my, you know, to one of the shepherds. Really? Is it that absolutely not? If you don't cut, you don't call this off." I'm going to divest you of all my... I mean, I'm, you're dead to me. And uh, he... She says, I'm, uh, I'm all in on this. And he kicks her out. So Rahiva comes back and we were told that you know they get married and they're super poor. And he promises, he says, if only I had all the money in the world, I would make you this beautiful tiara in the shape of Jerusalem. And, the, you know, and it's really sad. They're by themselves. Uh, you know, they have a little baby. And they all they have is hay. All they have is hay. They're living in this in a cave with hay. And they get a knock on the door one day. And they knock on the door. See the old man who says, um, you guys have maybe some hay we could have because we don't even have hay. And Robert Heber comforts his wife to tell her, oh, there's someone in the world that's even worse off than us. They don't even have hay. And eventually, uh, after a while, you know, after... Um, a while, she uh, encourages him to go to yeshiva, back to yeshiva, and he spends uh, he spends twelve years there. Uh, and sell her hair to fund his to the wig makers. I heard that. Once. Well, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stories, but she's one of the great uh, heroines uh, yeah, in I Jewish history. Um, and her story has been embellished. I'm just I'm, I'm working through some basic texts. Okay. Uh, you know, there might be other things out there as well. Um, now, it describes what happens when he gets to yeshiva. So he gets to yeshiva, and the, the teachers are Rabbi Yezer, right? the same Rabbi Yezer that we met, we, met, we met earlier, Rabbi Yehoshua. And the Talmud describes what happens to them. And he says to them, teachers, teach me the reason of the Mishnah. So they teach him one law, and he repeats it. And he starts asking questions. This is a characteristic of Rabbi Yehoshua that we see again and again. Every, no stone is left unturned. Nothing. He says, why is there this Aleph? Why is there this space? That's what it describes him. Why, why, why? Always asking, always never settling unless it's absolutely abundantly clear. Uh, after 12 years, he becomes already a renowned scholar. And he says, okay, my 12 years are up. I'm going back home to my family, to my wife, to my little kid. My, my kids are already grown up. And he goes there, and we find this dramatic exchange as he's about to get home, I'm sure everyone's very excited to see him, he overhears from the other side of the door a conversation that his wife is having with some other individual. The Talmud describes him as a wicked person. And the wicked person is saying to them, saying to her, your, your, your dad was 100% right to disown you. Because you know why? You married a bum. And, 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 and he starts berating her. And Rabbi Kiva hears from the other side of the door. He hears her saying, you know what? If my husband was here right now, I'd tell him to go back for another 12 years. So Rekiva turns around and goes back for 12 years. Now, there's a big debate as to whether or not did he go in and spend the night there or, or not. Uh, I think he probably did. Uh, but there are, that means it, the Talmud is a little bit ambiguous on this, you know. And it says, he hears the other side of the door, and he turns around, and he leaves. Now, that obviously can mean that he turns around, but of course, he spends some time, right? Or he just, you know, he, he doesn't stop. And there's this idea that, um, you know, when you want to study Torah, if you study Torah and then you say, okay, let's study Torah, let's stop right now, let's go outside for a little walk. Imagine we stopped the, we stopped the class and we said, okay, hey, how's, how's everyone doing? You know, what, what do you guys think about, the, I don't know, the sports or the weather? Like, whoa, what happened? We're studying Torah. Like, why are we interrupting? We don't interrupt Torah study. Uh, so Rabbi Kiva, like, 12 years immersed in Torah and... He's going to stop and have an interruption. He'll have to start from the beginning. You know, 12 plus 12 does not equal 24. That's the idea. I don't know. Did he stop and did he not stop? And regardless, we know he goes back to, to study for another 12 years. And after 24 years of uninterrupted scholarship, with his method of not leaving any stone unturned, he is the greatest scholar of his time. He's got 24,000 students, and he finally heads home. And when he heads home, the entire town comes around. Everyone comes to, to greet him. And, of course, his wife comes as well. And there's students and there's announcements and there's people. and there's 24,000 students. Can you imagine what that is? 
twenty-four thousand students. Like this, the, you know, this is the the, the most. Trump the, rally. <laughs> well. <laughs> How many kids does he end up with? Huh? How many children does Rabbi? Well, we don't. I, I I don't know. We don't know. Uh, we know that he had one son who was one of the Tanaim as well, Rabbi Yeshua. Um, I don't know if we know the exact number of kids that he had. Um, and, of course, his wife comes to the rally as well, or the event, or the parade, or the cavalcade, or whatever it is, this, this greeting of the great Torah scholar. And she you know, kind of makes her way to the front, and the students say, what are you doing here? And Rabbi says, wait a minute. My Torah and your Torah is her Torah. A very famous line. Sheli v'shelachem shelahi. Mine and yours is all her merit. If not for her, none of this would have happened. Uh, and incidentally, another person that he meets is his father-in-law. <laughs> now, they, he knows who his father-in-law is. His father has no idea. This, this Akiva is the same son-in-law from 25 years. He has no idea. And he tells him, he's like, um, I, have to, I, have, I made a vow to disown my daughter and now I regret it. It's been a long time. I want to kind of welcome her back. I want to know, is it possible for me to annul my vow? So he says to him, would you have made the vow had you known that your son-in-law would have studied some Torah? He says, if I, if, if I knew that my son-in-law would study even one Mishnah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have made that vow. He says, okay, Shalom Aleichem. I'm your son-in-law. Oh, mind blown, right? So uh, he, of course, annulled his vow and... Uh, we know that the Talmud goes on to say that eventually Rabbi Kiva, even though they start off as being very, very exceedingly poor, he became in, inordinately uh, wealthy as well. His father gave him half his money, uh, and it goes on to tell some other stories about how he he was very successful. Yeah. But twenty four years. Who supported him? That's what I want to know. Who? How did the wife and the child sustain yeah, themselves if the husband is away? Yeah. So that's a good question. Uh, the Talmud does talk about how he. Um, he was a wood chopper as well. It's not clear the timeline when he was chopping wood. Uh, <coughs> was it during? Was it before? Would he do that as well and send the money back? Um, probably something <coughs> like that. He would send some money back. Um, he came back to 64 years old. Or yeah. Well, he's going to live to 120. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, is there really good documentation of years of him? Chopping? Well, is it 100? Well, we know that he lived for a very long time. That, that you know, because we know when he died. Uh, and we also know what he saw. Like we, like there, there are landmarks. Was it 120 exactly or not? That's a question. Uh, I think some scholars say, "Oh, it was, it was 106, 110." Yeah. Uh, when did he die? 19, uh, in, not 19. In the year 135, 136, 138. All these different questions. But uh, the Talmud says very clearly that he lived to 120. Four people lived to 120. Mo- Moses, Hillel, Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai, and Rabbi Kiva. Now. You have to understand the language of the Talmud to know that is that saying that they all lived exactly 120 and none of them were 119, or were they all living for a really long time and they all represent, you know, paradigm shifts in Jewish leadership, you know. Uh, either way, that is the story. Now, what are, what are some takeaways? I, I made a list of some takeaways. But by the way, that was a mashup of several Talmuds. Uh, there's one Talmud in Adarim. And one Talmud in Subas, and they each give you part of the story. And of course, there's Avos Durnasim, the, the where it tells us the um, story of the hole in the rock. Uh, and I kind of mashed it up um, uh, in a way that's kind of um, chronological. Um, but I, I think there's some really important takeaways uh, from this story that that teach us a little bit about Erev Etiva, but also I think it's valuable lessons for us as well. Um, Rabbi Kiva sees the hole in the rock, right? And he says, oh, the water dripped in the rock, made the hole, and therefore the Torah will certainly penetrate in my heart. If you ask Rabbi Kiva, or you just examine this, this narrative, what is Torah? Torah, it's not just some accompanying wisdom that's really nice for us to have. It's like, hey, we're Jews, and this is our wisdom, and there's other wisdoms, and you know, this is really nice. To Rabbi Akiva, and indeed, this is the you know the, the thread within uh, you know traditionally uh, that has been um, you know has been the uh, understanding for the Jewish people. Torah is about changing who we are. The Torah penetrates our heart and changes us. 
You know, it's not just that it's some wisdom that we have that's in our minds, in our heads, that's really nice and makes a lot of sense and really challenging. No. The Torah's goal is not our brain, it's our heart. It's about penetrating our heart and changing us. You know, there's a very interesting exchange that we find with Rabbi Tiva at a later point in life. Uh, and it describes um, that there was, this is after the temple's destroyed and some of the rabbis are in, in, in hiding and they're in the loft of a fellow by the name of Nitza and Lud. We find a few teachings from the Talmud of what there was this uh, collection of rabbis in the loft. They're hiding like in the attic of a fellow by the name of Nitza in, in, in Lud. And they had a question. What was that question? Is study greater or is action greater? Like to do a mitzvah is a mitzvah, it's an action. And to do study, it's, it's study. Which one's greater? So it's a whole question back and forth. Rabbi, Tiva, uh, Rabbi Tarfon, who was, who was Rabbi uh, Ativa's colleague, Rabbi Tarfon says, action is greater. And that makes a lot of sense. Action, it's, it's who you are, it changes you. It's what you do, it's how you behave. It's also how you override what your head says. It's, yeah, it's a mitzvah. The, the, this is a demonstration of, you know, doing what's right, right? Um, and Rabbi Kiva says, no, study is greater. And ultimately, everyone concluded, everyone agreed to Rabbi Kiva that study is greater because study brings to action. Yeah. Talmud may be de maisa. Study brings to action. And I was thinking that Rabbi Kiva he also told us what study is. Rabbi Kiva's Torah study was not something that's relegated to your mind alone. If we study like Rabbi Kiva, we let the Torah, which is as hard as steel, penetrate our heart, which is soft, of course it'll change our behavior. Certainly. If that's the model of Torah study, certainly it will result in, in change. You know, I, I was with someone recently and on, on Thursday, and he said, um, what about the people that are Torah scholars, but they don't behave properly? So I said, I don't know, do you know such people? He says, yeah, I know lots of people. So I don't, it's not so clear, it's not so scientific, right? Um, but the idea is, Padre Talmud does talk about, pe- about people like that. In, in the most harshest of terms. And I think the reason why is it's not because they don't have the action, they don't have the behavior that is a commensurate or, or, or that, is, that, you know, that, is, uh, uh, that ought to parallel the scholarship, but rather the scholarship is wrong. Because if you study Torah correctly in the model that Rabbi Tiva describes for us, then automatically you'll change your behavior. It's, it's not that there are two unrelated things that ought to be, go, be, be together in concert. Rather, the Torah study itself is what's going to change a person, provided that the model is the model of let it penetrate my heart. And, you know, we find the Mishnah. The, the Mishnah says, don't treat the Torah as a shovel to dig with or as a crown to take glory in. It's possible to say, I'm going to use the Torah for my own benefit. I'll study Torah, I'll be able to teach it over, I'll have the straight Torah acumen, and people will look up to me. Are you, you're using Torah for yourself, not having Torah influence you. You want to use a Torah to dig your foundation of, of you know, to, you know to, to build your monument, or to have your glory. That's not, that, 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 that's not what Torah is all about. It's using Torah for your own good, for your own benefit. Torah ought to be something that's, you know, that changes our lives because it penetrates our heart and changes us and automatically will bring to action. That's the direct result. So if you have Torah, you have both. Now, is it possible to have Torah and, have, and, have, and, and, and not have it? Yes, but that means you're doing the Torah incorrectly. The model that Rabbi Tiva here de- demonstrates um, indeed would bring to action. What about the method? So he describes Torah study as being penetrating the heart. But if you also, you know, you notice, you see that it's only possible with, you know, tenacious and ceaseless and relentless study. You know, how many years did it take for that water to penetrate the rock? It it got there, but was it instantaneous? Was it overnight? Of course not. 
course. Talmud, the, I, one of the parts that I excerpted or I took out of it was a description of a guy who came to a mountain with a little pickaxe and said, okay, I'm, I want to take the mountain and I want to turn it all into sand and throw it in the water. Now, is, is that possible? Yeah, it's possible because you take any, any rock that you want, you could make a hole in it and turn it into sand and get rid of it. But if you're a mountain, oh, that sounds like a tall task. Right? Don't you think? But provided that you're dedicated, you'll get there. If you're dedicated, you'll get there. And Rabbi Kiva's kind of an inspiration to us because he's someone who started off with nothing. He, he was a nobody. He was ignorant. He was an Amaretz. <coughs> Excuse me. Yet he climbed the tallest mountain, right? He became the greatest scholar of his time. And what does that mean for us? And what does that, you know, how, do, how does that implicate us? You know, we'll say, hey, Lay, uh, we're not responsible that we didn't become great in Torah. You know why? You know, we, we started off life, we didn't have much of a background. You know who else started off life not without much of a background? Rabbi Kiva. Well, we got to make a living, right? Otherwise, we'll be poor. How am I going to feed my family? You know who was poorer than you'll ever be? Rabbi Akiva. So, you know, the great leader, Rabbi Akiva, is also someone that kind of forces the issue for us, right? There's nowhere to hide. If he could do it, we, yeah, we could do it as well. Took away all our excuses. Exactly. Took away all our excuses. And by the way, there is a Talmud that talks about, uh, about uh, all the excuses that someone could possibly have of why they didn't study Torah and says, one guy said, oh, I was so beautiful and so enamored with my own looks and dealing with my Yetzirah, I couldn't do it. So, so they say, well, were you more beautiful than Joseph? You know, Joseph, we know, was uh, uh, a, a really handsome man, exactly, the looker. <laughs> um, and it brings in, invokes Hillel, right? Hillel was someone who, who couldn't afford the stipend to, or the, the, the pittance that it took to get into the, into the base medicine and climbs in the roof. Go ahead. And what you're saying to me is, like those of us who didn't start out with a Jewish background or heritage or teaching or anything, look what we can do too if we have pride. And the, the son of converts, started. the son of converts, exactly. And Maimonides, when he gives his kind of overview of, of the transmission of the Torah, he points out every time that there were that there were instances where there were converts, right? So we have, uh, for example, you have. Um, Shmaya and Avtalion. Shmaya and Avtalion. Uh, these are, are, are two colleagues who were, kind of second century before the common era, uh, were the great Jewish leaders, and they were both converts. Rabbi Kiva, son of converts. I think Rameir also. He, and he, he points this out because, like we said, it's a meritocracy. It's not. It's not like uh, you know. We Torah does not. Torah is our birthright, but we don't get it all at birth. In fact, we forget it all at birth. <laughs> So, uh, so, and we all start off as being kind of on the same level, and, and the sky's the limit for all of us, which is obviously terrifying, but it's also inspiring. Um, and Rabbi Kiva demonstrates uh, that the method of achieving the Torah is like this relentless water, it just doesn't stop, drip after drip. And you know what? After 20 days of dripping, you see no change. You don't. You don't see the change. But when you look back after 24 years of dedication, you know, you change the world. It's kind of like a parent with a child. You sometimes don't realize what you have accomplished because when you're in the trenches day after day, sometimes you do not feel like you're making headway. But I think Absolutely, sometimes yeah. children grow up to be okay people. Despite Shockingly. Your, <laughs> shockingly, yes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but we but we see that if the method, the method of of total immersion in Torah, twenty four years uninterrupted, right, doesn't take any time off. Right? Water is just kind of constantly again and again, and not leaving any stone unturned, being relentless, you get there. And I I, I want to pull out something else as well. You know, can you imagine the kind of shame of having to go back to first grade? Uh, you have people with graduate degrees that never study Hebrew, but they want to do Torah. They have graduate degrees, they're successful in their fields, and they want to study Torah. And you got to go back to the kindergarten, learning what the letters are. Remember, he had to sit down with, the, with his son, it describes it. he goes with his son to school. Can you imagine? Putting in the backpack, 
lunch. What, what, what did he read? He didn't read anything. He didn't know. He well, read. he was in. He. I'm saying, it, it's possible that he 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 was illiterate. It's possible. We well, you know he had great character, but you know it's not unheard the idea of at that of time. The shepherd. He's a shepherd, and his boss is a rabbi. Who was, has all these was boss well? So he he's, he has two bosses in the story. His first boss we know is is a rabbi, but who had lots of assets. Okay. He doesn't necessarily know who he is. Eventually, he went to study by him. Okay, so let's let's look a bit a little bit about. Uh, uh, so we see like once again he had this no fear of show social judgment. You know he was able to withstand scrutiny. not the scrutiny but the the shame of going back to first grade. Uh, to get there, you know, whatever it takes to get there. Of course, so uh, you mentioned how, so before he began his Torah studies, he hated Torah scholars so much he wanted to buy them like a donkey, but then his employer was his Torah scholar who he gave the benefit of the doubt to in all those circumstances. I guess that was, that was... Le- no, that, so, so, okay, fine. So I, I spent, like, a lot of time this week thinking about that question. Um, oh. means, how is it possible that someone wants to bite people like a donkey, yet has tremendous character. And in fact, like his wife, so she saw his character. She saw his capacity. She saw his ability. She saw his potential. And she said, I- I'll give up everything to marry him if he dedicates his life to Torah to- to study. So I have a few theories. I have two theories of my own, and I have the Tosvos asked this question as well. I think it's possible that there were actually two points of his life before he started studying because uh, if you actually look at the words of the Talmud, it describes him, A, as an Amma Aretz, which is kind of a, a label. He's an Amma Aretz. He's an ignorant person. And then it describes him as someone who never studied. And maybe there's a difference between someone who has a hatred towards Torah scholars, because he's an Amma Aretz. He's an anti. And then he's not an anti anymore. He just never studied. Right? That's one That's one possibility. Um or I think it's possible that his great character that fueled his disdain for the people that had what he wanted more than anything else. It means Rabbi Kiva is someone who had the great character and he was just missing the Torah. It's not just, it's, it's a bit just, right? That, that He had almost everything that you needed besides for the crucial point. And he wanted that more than anything else. For whatever reason, it just didn't work out. And therefore, the people that had it, the people that were where he wanted to be were the ones that he kind of envied the most and had this kind of, you know, because he had such a desire to be like them, you know. Um, And I think that's a common sentiment. If, you know, if someone who's in your field, who's the most successful, and you cannot, you feel like you can never get there, you can never unseat them, you kind of have this competition, this kind of, you know, you want to get there, and they're there, and you're not. Uh, or it's possible that he felt, um, so the third possibility was that he had great character, but he felt that maybe the Torah scholars weren't inclusive or they didn't afford him the opportunities. Whatever reason, he had kind of a beef against them, a more specific beef against them. But either way, I think the question is a fantastic question because um, it doesn't seem to be uh, congruent where someone who has a great character and someone who's very pious and modest and uh, judging favorably yet wants to bite people like donkeys and break their bones. Well, it's obvious his wife had some great insight. Did maybe she have the influence on him that started softening his heart and um, changing his attitude? Yeah, to me, the, the interesting thing about his wife, like his wife, she probably had, well, we know she had great character, um, and she probably had, you know, whoever she wanted uh, to select as a spouse. Uh, yet she chose the unproven commodity in Rabbi Akiva. <coughs> so there had to be something so kind of over the top about him that she was able to take the gamble of marrying him when she could have married someone who was already, like, or already a scholar. And, you know, you kind of have guaranteed results. Um, I was thinking the same thing, that what was it about him that she would have seen and yeah, and, and it, it seemed like she had the keen insight. Well, to lose her family like that. Oh, yeah. She dedicated everything. I mean, that's a big deal, too. Yeah, oh, exactly. And, and Robert Kiva says everything that we have, it's all in her merit. You know, she 
she's the one who gave up more than anything else, even more than Rebbe Kiva himself. It's just amazing. It's unbelievable. Yeah, he, so he instantly had this hope, but only because he had the capacity of applying what he saw to himself. Okay, so let's look a little bit about the style of Shorvik. So we see he's a great scholar, great scholar. He's giving you guys a little example uh, from the Talmud. Talmud has a discussion of the laws of Tzara Sabas. Now, I could spend maybe 10 minutes describing what it is, but either way, it's a very complicated, trust me, it's a very complicated law wherein um, the vast majority of the opinions of the authorities say one way, and there were some minority opinions that say another way, and the Talmud discusses how it's, in this particular law it's very important, it's imperative, that there is unity in halacha, in behavior. So you can't have one renegade rabbi going rogue and teaching his people to go against the majority. But either way, they heard that a fellow by the name of Dosa ben Harkinos, this great rabbi, that he taught like the minority view. So a collection of scholars, Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Elazar, and of course, <coughs> Rabbi Tiva said, well, let's go visit him and talk to him. Because it's absolutely unacceptable to have someone not, not just teaching, but also instructing people to behave like this minority opinion. Why? Because it'll cause problems, and it'll be magzir, it'll be a disaster. So they went to him, and they, they started talking to him, this whole description of what happened. Um, who are these people? Um, and he says, he just, he, they introduced Rabbi Elazar and, and Rabbi Yeshua, and of course they introduced Rabbi Akiva, and he says to him, are you the famous Rabbi Akiva, whose name goes from one end of the world to the other end of the world? Sit, my son, sit. There should be a lot of people like you in Israel. By the way, a cool factoid. Right, he describes Rabbi Kiva as, your name goes from one end of the world to the other end of the world. Mi all of that, so from one end of the world to the other end of the world. If you take the gematria of mi sofa all of that, sofo, it equals the exact number of times Rabbi Kiva is mentioned in the Talmud. Rabbi Kiva, your name goes from one end of the world to the other end of the world, every time that it's described in the Talmud. Very interesting. I saw that maybe in, I saw that like ten years ago on the back of the of this particular Talmud. Whoa, how cool is that? Um, when my son uh, Akiva was born, well, when he was born, but when he had a bris, we were going back eight, almost exactly eight years. Uh, we were studying this particular tractate of the Talmud in in Israel, and uh, and when my Rebbe, my my teacher, came to the bris, he came a little bit later. And he missed the naming of the of the baby. So he said, "What's the name?" He said, "Akiva." He says, "Oh, Akiva." We already just saw in, in in the Talmud the name. Your name goes from one end of the world to the other end of the world. Yeah. Either way, so they sit there and they start talking to him about this law. And they start talking. They, well, they don't want to be. They want to be a little bit tactful. So they start talking about other laws and we're discussing. And eventually, they kind of push the conversation towards Torah Sabas issue at hand. And he says to them, "No, I, I don't like Hillel. I go like the Hillel, like everyone else does." He says, "Wait a minute. We heard that you go like Beshamai, like the minority opinion." So he says to them, "Did you hear Dosa, or did you hear Ben Hortinus? What exactly did you hear? Because I think you might be referring to my brother." But watch out, he has 300 proofs that he's right. Be very careful with him. He's a really sharp guy, and he does, he's not scared of arguing. So, they, they um, split up Rabbi uh, Elazar, Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Kiva. They, they say goodbye to those about Arkinus. And they say, let's go find this other guy, Yonasan ben Arkinus, the brother. And of course, Rabbi Kiva meets him, and they start talking, and he says, okay, I heard that you say this, and you have 300 proofs, and he says, okay, here are my 300 proofs. Proof number one, and read the proof. And Rabbi Kiva just, you know, uh, the, the, um, re- re- rebuffs him, right? D- this proves it. And third proof, second, second, third, fourth, fifth, he brings him 300 proofs, and Rabbi Kiva, with his tremendous uh, uh, Torah knowledge, 
is able to swat them away one after another. And this guy is so impressed, and he says, Rabbi Akiva, you're a great Torah scholar. Your name goes from one end of the world to the other end of the world. You're praiseworthy that you achieved greatness and name, but you still haven't achieved the level of shepherds of live of livestock. So basically he's telling him, you think you're so hot, right? You think you're such a great Torah scholar. Yeah, you have something, but you're no better than a shepherd of livestock. And a retriever responds, no, I'm not actually not even a shepherd of sheep, of small animals. So, you know, we think of this as, you know, Rabbi Tiva, someone who's so, oh, so humble, like it says, like Moses, he's humble. You know, he doesn't want to say, yeah, I'm really nothing. Um, but the, the true understanding of this Talmud is that Rabbi Tiva, <laughs> Rabbi Tiva and this guy, Jonas and Ben Hortinus, is they're having a discussion about the Torah itself. Rabbi Tiva is someone who, more than anyone of his generation, was able to have a vast understanding of Torah. But Torah is the mind of the Almighty. Torah is God's knowledge. Like God, it too is infinite. There's no way someone can know all of Torah, because the more you know, the more you realize how little you know. And therefore, he's telling him, Rabbi Tiva, you know more Torah than anyone else around. True, granted. But compared to what Torah really is, you're nothing more than a simple shepherd of livestock. And Rabbi Tiva says, no, 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 no. I'm like a shepherd of smaller animals. My accomplishment in Torah is even less impressive compared to how Torah really is. Torah is even greater. That's what he's telling him. He's not telling him that I know less. He's saying, no, Torah is even greater. I.e., what does this teach us? Rabbi Tiva, who knew more Torah than this guy, therefore he had a bigger perspective of what Torah really is. You know, there's a direct correlation between how much Torah you know and how much Torah you think there is out there that you don't know. You know, we see the kids who are liberated from Sunday school, right? They're bar mitzvah. They don't need to do this again. They've done it all. Right? They're experts. And then the people that, know, that spend 18 hours a day studying Torah, to them, they feel like they know nothing. I think you gave me the analogy once of uh, putting your, like it's compared to the seat, because you can put your toe in and be like, get something out of it, but once you move out into the, the sea, you look around, you, you see it. The deeper you go in, the more vast it becomes. Yes, exactly. I mean, you, you, could, you could, you know, go into the ocean up to your ankles, like, oh, this is good. I could walk all the way to Japan, right? <laughs> no problem. This is fine. You know, bring some provisions with me, but I'm good to go. Because at the entrance of the water, you know, it's kind of, it is very shallow, and that's what your perspective is. And the deeper you go, the deeper you realize the further you go in, and like we said, that's the the, the 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 Torah itself is described in the Torah itself as being like the ocean. Yeah, that, that's exactly this this point. Now, Rabbi Kiva has his twenty four thousand students. Of course, it doesn't necessarily end very well for him. We know that the students there was a um, there was a plague that killed many, many, many of his students. We're told in the Talmud that's because. They didn't have respect for each other, even though Rabbi Kiva was the one who said, You should love your fellow as yourself. This is a general uh, principle in Torah. This is a foundational principle in Torah. Uh, there was something about his students that, uh, that they, they didn't behave necessarily like that, uh, and therefore they died. Uh, but, not all of them died, and the ones that remained are the ones that taught Torah to the next generation. Um, this particular uh, episode in his life, where he has these 12,000 groups of students, so that's, if, if every group is two, 24,000 students, uh, and they, many of them died because of their lack of respect to each other. Um, we know that uh, on Lagba Omer, the third day of Omer, they stopped dying. Uh, and 
the whatever remained, the few that remained were the ones that rebuilt uh, Torah. Now, I think this is interesting, kind of, uh, it's an interesting thing to analyze. Why did Rabbi Akiva's lessons um, not influence his students to the degree that it maybe it should have? Uh, and why did they have a lack of respect for each other uh, that caused them to die? So that, that, that's an interesting thing. I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, lessons that we can learn from Rabbi Akiva, um, the things that the Talmud does stress that, that he taught uh, to us, some of the timeless uh, eternal lessons that we can draw still today uh, insight and meaning from. So uh, I want to start with, with the idea of suffering. Um, Rabbi Tiva, perhaps more than anyone else in the Talmud, uh, is the expert in this issue. Uh, and we'll start off with a story, which was kind of like a mantra that he had. Everything that, he, everything that happened to him, he was always looking for the positivity. It's always, it's from the Almighty, it's always, it's for good. And the Talmud tells that he was traveling to a certain city, and uh, he went, uh, he's traveling, it's, it's long, it's a, it was a long way, and he stopped uh, at night at a certain town, and no one was willing to rent him out a room. All the hotels are, are full, no one wants to offer him a space, he has to go to the forest and sleep by himself. And what does he say when this happens to him? Everything the money does is for the best. Fine. He's in the, uh, he's in the, he's in the forest, and he has his donkey that he's traveling with. He has his rooster that's going to wake up in the morning, and of course he has he's got his candle that he studies Torah with. And this wind comes and blows out the candle, and of course maybe he would be devastated, but he says everything the money does is for the best. And then there's a, uh, you know, this this there's this uh, uh, an animal that pounces upon. His rooster and kills it. He's like, oh, everything might have the best. And a lion comes and kills his donkey. And he says, everything might have the best. And the morning he wakes up and he sees this guy running at him all frazzled. He says, oh, overnight, a, you know, a group of bandits came to the town and killed everyone in the town. And I'm the only survivor. And Rekiba realizes that had he gotten a place in town, he too would have likely been amongst the uh, victims and if there was an old candle or there was the noise from his rooster or donkey, he would have been found as well. Uh, that's just a, a little bit of an example of his perspective. But then we find that uh, very, and I don't think I mentioned this uh, ever here in this uh, setting, it's very interesting. When Rebel Yezer is sick, so his teacher is sick and he's on his deathbed, and all his students come to visit him. And he's suffering tremendously, tremendous pain. And all the students see Rabbi, say, see Rabbi Eliezer suffering, and they all start crying. And they all start crying, and Rabbi Kiva starts laughing. It's kind of like inappropriate. You know, you're by the deathbed of your teacher, and everyone's crying, and that seems to be appropriate. And Rabbi Kiva's laughing. So they say to him, why, why are you laughing? So he says to them, why are you guys crying? He says, why are we crying? We see a, a, a virtual Torah scroll in pain and we're not going to cry? He says, that's exactly why I'm laughing. Why? Because I said, every time when I saw our teacher, I saw him answer, his wine never fermented. His flax never, uh, well, you know, was n- never suffered. His... Oil never spoiled. Everything he touched turned to gold. Remember, this is the same employer that he had years and years and years uh, prior. Everything he did just had tremendous blessing. Okay. He never suffered a day in his life. Ever when I saw that, I was wondering, maybe he used up all his merits in this world. All the reward that he had for all his Torah scholarship and his greatness, he got over here on planet Earth. But now that I see that he's suffering here, now I know that whatever he, you know, his nest egg is safe in Olamaba, in the next world. And Rabbi Eliezer hears this. He's like, wait a minute. That implies that I have some sins to atone for. Uh, 
maybe we can spend some time talking about Rabbi Yezer because maybe we have to do a biographical we'll stash st- st- on him because he was a very sharp, great, one of the great characters and tragic characters as well in, in Jewish history. Uh, he was one who was excommunicated as well. Um, but he's like, wait a minute, uh, Akiva, you implied that I have some sins that I need to atone for and I'm atoning for them here, here in this world? He says, yes, because you taught us the verse, there's no righteous person in the world who, do, who does good and doesn't sin. <laughs> so everyone has sin, and therefore you have sin as well, and therefore the fact that you got punished in this world is to your betterment. And this perspective of, of understanding why people like Rabbi Yezer, great, great, great people, good people, by any measure, why they suffer in this world, uh, Rabbi Kiva, in this Talmud, but other places in Talmud as well, he shows us the reason why they suffer is actually for their good. It's actually something to be, obviously, you know, to us it was unimaginable, but he, he was excited, he was delighted to see Rabbi Lezer suffering. And not that he wants to see other people suffering, but because he understands that we live in a world where nothing is unaccounted for. Nothing. As great as you are, if you have any sin, that has to be addressed. And where do you want it to be addressed? You want it to be addressed in the place where you get the sting, and that's it. It's done with. Right? It's temporary. It's passing. It's like uh, in the grand scope of, of, of all of existence, our little 70, 80, 90 year sliver of life it's really immaterial. And we describe it as like a passing wind or, a, uh, or like a dream. It's like, yeah, you're there. For, it's very vivid at the time, but the next day you forget about it. That's what life is really here. If you are going to pay a penance for your behavior, the best place you could possibly do it is in this transient world. That's what Rabbi Kiva taught us. And of course, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to accept, you know, pain and suffering is something which you know, is very sad and it's, you know, it's, it's scary uh, and it's, of course, disturbing when we see people that, by any uh, account, are, are good people, are great people. But Rabbi Kiva taught us a great lesson and that is that when someone is suffering here, that means that they're not suffering there. And that is in the grand scheme of things, better for them. Um, now, we know that uh, Moses maybe didn't understand this as intuitively as Rabbi Kiva did. Um, the Talmud describes, and this one we did talk about it a while back, so maybe we'll refresh your memory. The Talmud describes Moshe going up to heaven and he sees the Almighty tying crowns on top of letters. And he says, why, why are you tying crowns? Who needs to do tie crowns on top of letters? It's enough to write the whole Torah. You don't need to give us crowns. And the Almighty tells him, well, well Rabbi Akiva is going to be around in many generations. And he is going to deduce and derive piles and piles of laws from every crown. And like we said, Rabbi Akiva, his quality as a scholar was to ask question and not allow anything. So if he saw a crown, a letter, one letter had a crown, one letter didn't have a crown, that would mean something to him. That would be one of those stones that he would overturn. And Moshe says, wow, you know, he's taken by this, and he says, show me Rabbi Kiva, and he goes to Rabbi Kiva's classroom. He's, that's the time travel. He's time traveled to Rabbi Kiva's classroom, and he doesn't understand, and, and then eventually the student asks Rabbi Kiva, well, what's this, well, where's this lesson from? He says, oh, this is Allah, Moshe, we've seen this is a lesson from Moshe, that's signed, and Moshe is placated. And he goes back to God and says, wow, such Torah, we give the Torah through him. And he says, no, I want to give the Torah through you. And Moshe says, you showed me the vastness of Rabbi Akiva's Torah, now show me his reward. And he shows him his reward. And what's his reward? He's being flayed alive. So Moshe comes back to God flabbergasted. Uh, This is the Torah, this is the reward? How is this reward? Moshe, we know Rabbi Akiva died tragically. Right? As a martyr, the Romans killed him because he was teaching Torah. We'll get to that story a little, in a little bit. In a little bit. But how is this reward for Torah? You know, God says, "Don't ask questions. This is the way it is." 
And indeed, for us, we see the question that Moshe asked, and it seems a very legitimate question. This is Torah. This is the reward. How, how, how is this? You know, I asked, show me the reward of Rabbi Kiva, not the punishment of Rabbi Kiva. And the answer is that the greatest reward that someone could have from God's perspective is that their sins are cleansed in this world. Indeed, Moshe asks God, you showed me his Torah, show me his reward. And God shows him he'd be inflated alive. And that's punishment. We have to, to shuv us so we could reset things. I can't imagine Rabbi Kiva had amounted that many sins that he had not, not, not done to shuv before that weren't being filleted. Maybe they were from a off. previous lifetime. Well, okay. Fine, that's a good question. Um, maybe there were some things that, uh, you know, the tshuva has to be perfect. And, you know, but we have this idea, and that, that was probably Rebbe Leezer's question as well. Like, is it, is it possible that I have sins? And we have this verse that tells us that everyone has something that they need to atone for. Um, as to the scope, remember, the scope of the punishment is all relative, right? If you look at this life as being a dream, so you know you have a terrifying dream and it's so real and vivid at the time and you're being chased by someone and your teeth are falling out or whatever dreams you have, right? And it's so terrifying at the time, but it's really in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing, right? So for us to kind of give scope to pain... From the spiritual perspective, I'm not trying, not trying, not trying to, uh, you know, diminish the pain that we have as humans, but from God's perspective, right? It's, it's, it's really immaterial compared to the big picture. And also, you, you mentioned in the past that the higher you go as a Torah scholar, the more your sin counts against you versus, or the higher, the the, the more you're scrutinized. You know, the more finely you're being judged. This uh, stuff, though, does seem torturous. Oh, yeah. I it's mean, it's terrible. Just think about it. It's, it's terrible. It's terrible. But we'll see Rabbi Kiva himself, what he thought about it. So Moshe, Mo, to Moshe, he doesn't understand how, when he asks to see the reward of Rabbi Kiva, and he gets shown Rabbi Kiva's punishment, he doesn't understand how that's reward. Rabbi Kiva himself, when he sees the, the suffering of his teacher, he starts laughing. He, to him, this is delightful. You know, maybe you shouldn't be laughing. Maybe you have a perspective on it. But to him, it's, it's positive. It's not just, it's reward. So Rabbi, Rabbi Kiva had a perspective that Moshe didn't. And by the way, none of us do. <laughs> uh, but it's a perspective that Rabbi Kiva had. And we'll see when Rabbi Kiva himself was suffering, he, even when it was his own suffering, he had that same perspective. And that's, I think, a, a lesson that even though maybe it'll be hard for us to inculcate, to have that feeling, but we can at least maybe understand uh, a, a little bit better. Um, and I think, you know, the f- idea of always finding the positive in whatever scenario you have, you know, his doesn't get invited, no one, no one has a room for him, and the candle gets blown out, and always positive. And his teacher suffering finds the positive. There's a great story about him as well. Um, as we know, if you look at the timeline, so the year 70, the temple's destroyed. Uh, and uh, Rabbi Kiva's kind of coming into his own at that time. Uh, and he's one of the scholars then, but in the, in, you know, the, in the subsequent uh, years, it was a very challenging time for the Jews. You know, they were living under Roman occupation and Roman persecution. And the temple's in ruins now. And the story goes that Rabbi Lazar and Azari, the same characters, Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Kiva, they're traveling. And they hear the, 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 the noises of the, of the Roman legions that are miles and miles away. And the, the, the mighty sounds of victory from the Romans. And they all start crying, and Rabbi Kiva starts laughing. Same exact kind of parallel. They're all crying and he's laughing. And they say to him, why are you laughing? You see the, you know, the might of our enemy and you laugh? And he says to them, why are you guys crying? 
Same response. And they say to him, you see these despicable people that they bow down to grass and they, uh, they give offerings to idols and they're sitting peacefully and quietly and us, our temples destroyed in fire, we won't cry? How can you not cry? The, the Jewish nation is in shambles. And the, our enemies, which are terrible people by any, magi- by, by, you know, by, by any measure of, 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 uh, of morality, and they're, they're calm and they're quiet and they're happy and they're peaceful. How can we not cry? The keeper says, that's exactly why I'm laughing. Exactly the same reason. Finding the positivity. If the people that go against God get treated so nicely, how much more so will the people that follow what the Almighty wants, how much more so will they have the peace and the serenity and the happiness and the bliss? Another story. They were, they, the same cast of characters, they arrived to Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem's in ruins. They reach Mount Scopus. Mount Scopus is the mountain where you're able to see right onto Temple Mount. And they all, they all rend their clothing. We know there's a law that uh, a, a, a Jew who sees the, the ruins of the temple has to tear their clothing in, in mourning, just like, uh, just like when, when someone's, the laws of mourning tell us that when someone's uh, close relative dies, like a, sis, a sibling or a parent, you rend your clothing. That's the, that's the halacha. So they get there and they see it. They see the temple it used to be, you know, so grandiose and the center of Jewish life, and now it's, it's in ruins. And they, they rip their clothing, all of them do. And they get a little closer. They see there's a fox right there at the epicenter of the temple where the where the holy of holy was. There's a fox. There's animals just wa- ro- roaming around, and then that's too much, and they all start crying. Rukiva starts laughing once again. And they say to him, Why are you how can you possibly be laughing at this sight? And he says to them, Why are you guys crying? I'm, the reason, you know, why are you crying? He says, Why are we crying? We we we, we find that the, the temple where it says uh, that the foreigner who comes close to the temple should be put to death. We know that Israelites are not allowed to walk into the holy of holies. But Israelite does, they're put to death. And now there's animals walking through, and we're not going to cry. So he says to them, that's exactly why I'm laughing. Same exact reason. Why? This is a little bit of inside baseball here. So he quotes a verse here as follows. He quotes a verse in Isaiah that invokes Uriah and Zechariah. Uriah, these are two prophets that lived hundreds of years uh, away from each other. And we've asked the question to, to his colleagues. He says to them, what, why would the verse invoke Uriah and Zechariah? And he says, let, says let, let me tell you why the verse invokes them. It says, because Uriah, his prophecy was about the downfall of Jerusalem. And it'll be disaster, and it'll be uh, desolation. And Zechariah, he talked about the rebuilding of Jerusalem. That Jerusalem will once again come back to life. And he says, from the fact that we see now, together, we see that Uriah's prophecy is true, and it's put in the same verse as Zechariah's prophecy, now we're guaranteed that Zechariah's prophecy will be true as well. Because you know why? Because if this one didn't come true, who said that one would become true? But now that we see with certainty that Uriah's prophecy came true, certainly Zechariah's prophecy will be true, Jerusalem will bloom and flourish yet again. And they say to him, Akiva, I'm telling you, Akiva, you consoled us. Once again, we see that Rabbi Akiva, in every situation of his life, always found the good, always found the positive. Um, and we know at that time, he was, uh, he was, you know, a, um, they were suffering um, under, uh, most under Hadrian, of course. Uh, Hadrian made very punitive laws against Jewish life and practice. He uh, he said um, he decreed Jews who study Torah publicly get executed. Jews who confer smicha to each other get executed. Not only that, the city in which the smicha is conferred gets destroyed. Uh, observance of Shabbos, mm-hmm. observance of circumcision, all the laws, all the central laws 
of Judaism are curtailed and curbed and banned. And Rabbi Akiva is actually at the forefront of the movement of the rebellion, of Bar Kokhba rebellion. We know that obviously didn't end off so well. Uh, so from the year 132 to 135, Bar Kokhba uh, mounted a successful rebellion against Rome. They managed to expel the Romans from Israel, establish foreign uh, sovereignty over the land, uh, even mint coins. By the way, the coins that you have in Israel today are replicas of the coins that they found from the times of Bar Kokhba. Very interesting. Kind of the uh, Israeli spirit of like, we're not going to take anything from anyone. <laughs> we're going to fight back. Um, Did you see that seal they found in Israel here the other day and it was of a woman's name? A woman... Well, we know that uh, they mount, they 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 minted coins of of women crying, like after after they destroyed the temple. Romans did that. We still have those coins as well. Um, and Rabbi Kiva, of course, uh, we're told was someone who thought that Bar Kokhba was Mashiach, or at least could have been Mashiach. Uh, of course, that ended very very badly. But either way, uh, after the rebellion was stamped out, the uh, Romans and Hadrian reinforced uh, their decrees against the Jews, and they said whoever teaches Torah publicly would be put to death. And Rabbi Kiva is still gathering the multitudes and getting together to teach them Torah. And people, this guy came over to Rabbi Kiva and says to him, Akiva, you're not worried about the kingdom? You're not worried about the Romans? And he says to him, let me give you an example, give you an analogy. What's the analogy? Imagine you have a fox who is walking at the edge of the river. And he sees little pools of little groups of fish that are going from one place to the other place. And then they're kind of running around and they're, they're escaping. And he says to them, the fox says to the fish, why, why, why are you, what, what are you running away from? What are you escaping? And he says to them, because there are their nets, and the nets are trying to grasp us and catch us and kill us. And he says to them, so the fox says to them, why don't you just come into the water, there's, onto the land? There's no, there's, no, there's no nets over here. Just come into the, onto the land mass and you'll be safe. And we'll live together in peace. So they said to him, Obviously, the fish responded, you're so clever, you're not that clever at all. You're silly. If in the place where we could live, we'll ha- we have danger, so much more so we'll have danger in the place where we'll automatically die. Right? We need to be in the water to have our oxygen. The only place we could possibly live is a dangerous place. We'll go to a place that will for sure die, of course, it's even a more dangerous place. Uh, and the... The idea that he's conveying here is that we know that the Torah is described as our lifeblood. It's our life. So and without Torah, he would die. Without Torah, we're dead anyhow. So yes, you'll say, well, Torah is causing you to have, being in the water is causing you to be, uh, be you know, have these nets that are being uh, uh, put out to ensnare you. Yeah, of course, but this is where the only place we can live. We come out of Torah, we're dead meat. And of course, we know uh, it wasn't a long time later and Rabbi Kiva is captured for teaching Torah, and they put him in prison. And by the way, you know who his cellmate is? The same guy who told him, don't study Torah. And the guy tells him, praiseworthy, if only I could have gotten caught for teaching Torah. At least you got caught for teaching Torah. I said, don't teach Torah, and I anyhow got caught. <laughs> and um, the, of course, the tragic end of Rabbi Kiva. They took him out uh, to execute him, and they were scraping off his skin with iron combs. And it was a time to say the Kriya Shema, time, time to say the Shema. And he was accepting him, he was saying the Shema, and his students say to him, Teacher, right, this, much, this, this much is your dedication? And he says to them like this, listen to this, guys. He says to them, Every day when I said the Shema, and we say, you should love the Almighty God with all your hearts, with all your soul, 
but with all your resources. What does that mean? It means to dedicate your life to God, even if you lose your life. Every day when I said this, I, 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 I pined, when will this opportunity come and I can fulfill it? Every day was suboptimal because he was not able to do that. And now, finally I have the opportunity to fulfill it. I'm not going to say the Shema. To us, we think of martyrdom as being, you know, the unfortunate reality where we have to give up a life for God. To Rabbi Kiva, his whole life was trying to get to that point where he was able to have the opportunity to give up his life for God. That's why he said, you can love God with all your soul. That's right. That's right. And that's what he said. That, that's, the, that's the verse that he says. And he was saying the Shema, and he said the word Echad really loud, really, really long. He elongated that word until his soul departed him. And the Talmud goes on to say that there was a prophecy that announced praiseworthy is Rabbi Akiva, whose soul departed with Echad, with saying the word Echad. Um, Could it also be that he was happy and not necessarily happy, but because he was um, suffering in a sense, so his what he did was, you know, taking place here, you know? Yeah, well, what's interesting is that we Moshe saw that as well. And to Moshe, it was very perplexing. This is the Torah, and this is the reward. And Rabbi Tiva, to him, he's delighted. Right. He feels that this is an opportunity that he's been waiting for. Uh, and, you know, uh, of course, that's in, it's inspiring for us to hear about his martyrdom. Uh, and this is kind of an image that teaches us till this day. You know, it's, he's one of the uh, Yom Kippur service. Part of the Yom Kippur service is to talk about the ten martyrs of that time. Uh, the Asar Harute Malchus, the ten martyrs that were killed, ten great Torah scholars that were killed by the Romans. And to, to this day, we, we find inspiration from Rabbi Kiva. Now, the Talmud itself gives us a, a eulogy of him. So first it says that there was a prophecy that announced, praiseworthy is Rabbi Akiva, who is welcomed into Olam Haba. Um, but the Talmud gives us two little eulogies about, about Rabbi Akiva, which I think, you know, it's nice to be eulogized by the Talmud even once, Right? Well, certainly twice. Uh, and it says as follows. Four, it's a five-word eulogy. Can you imagine a five-word eulogy? This is the eulogy. And just think about the impact of what it's saying. Mishemes Rabbi Akiva. I guess it's Rabbi Akiva. That's two words. So it's six words. Batal covered HaTorah. When Rabbi Akiva died, from when Rabbi Akiva died, honor of Torah died as well. He was the last person who honored Torah. Well, then what does that mean? So Rashi explains, because he dedicated his heart to deriving and deducing every jot and tittle of every letter. The way he honored Torah was by really treating it as the Word of God. If it's the Word of God, then nothing is superfluous. Nothing is like, nothing to be washed over as being not as important. Every letter, every little indentation of a letter is from God. And to honor Torah is to treat it as the work of God. And therefore, when Rabbi Kiva died, he was the last one who, the last great one to actually do that. And of course, the Talmud was not to say, uh, we know that this, I'm saying I cut out a lot. Uh, if, I, if we brought every time Rabbi Kiva's name is mentioned in the Talmud, we would be here until next week. Uh, but the Talmud does say that Rabbi Kiva, every word et, the word et is kind of a word, like imagine the word and. Or the word the. It's a very common word. We don't have a parallel to, in English. Every word at in the Torah, he said, I'm going to deduce a law from this. Every single one. Every word, every letter was valuable. The Talmud draws out to say, the, the, the Rashi gives us an example. Bas ubas. An extra letter, one little vav, he derived piles and piles of law from it. And that's honor of Torah. Nothing goes, nothing goes in vain. Rabbi Kiva indeed viewed Torah as the word of God. If, if we do that, well, then of course you'll respect, you'll have the honor, the requisite uh, respect for it, and you'll treat it as such, and therefore nothing is extra, nothing is superfluous. Everything has a reason and a purpose. And that's the first eulogy. The second eulogy is a little bit longer. It's got uh, two, four, six, eight, nine words. And it says, from when Rabbi Kiva died, the arms of Torah seized, and the wellsprings of wisdom 
were closed up. And Rabbi Kiva was someone who had these wellsprings of wisdom. He had this deep understanding of, remember, 300 questions. Can you imagine 300 questions? Do you even have 300 questions in any, in any issue? Yeah. Someone who comes with 300 proofs on a law that is in the minority. 300! And Rabbi Kiva just swats them away like flies. You know? Such deep understanding of Torah is unfathomable to us. And that, that kind of ended where Rabbi died. Uh, and, you know, there's other great stories about the uh, um, four people ended the pardis. Pardis means an orchard. But in this instance, pardis means an understanding of God himself. Which is something we don't do, right? We do not, we're not even allowed to pronounce the name of God himself. But the Talmud just talks about the four scholars that entered the orchard. One of them went insane, one of them died, and one of them uh, became a heretic. And only Rabbi Kiva entered with peace and exited with peace. So like, by the way, that, just one line in Talmud, we could have a whole class in that, at least one, maybe like all series. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, his greatness in every area, just unimaginable, and to think that he started off with nothing, no background, no learning. He didn't, run, he didn't even want to read. Just unbelievable inspiration for us uh, that, you know, there's hope for us as well, you know. Rabbi Kiva, was he destined for greatness? Yes. But are we destined for greatness as well? Yeah. All of us are destined for greatness. You know, the Talmud says that you know, the Jewish perspective has always been that the Almighty created the world for me. If there was only me and only and every person is only them, then the world was worthy to have been created. Because there's greatness, untapped greatness within each and every one of us. And Rakiva had his greatness available for him, but had he not taken the initiative, he also would have been a bum, a bum like us. So was it he that took the initiative completely, or was his, his wife? Oh yeah, of course. Of, course, of course, of course, of course, of course. You know, she. You know, as well. She's. She she's the like we said. All of his Torah is attributed to her as well. They're partners in this. So is that the way it is for all of us? me and hopefully I inspired him during the course of the length of time we know each other. Everybody shows up for us in our experience because of something we need to learn from them. And they are yes, the yes, 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 yes. But are we actually maximizing our greatness? Mm-hmm. We're not, we, well, well, maybe, we, maybe it maybe. takes the pieces of everyone showing up in our lives. They are our contrast. That's true, uh, but are we going to take all of these consequences of our lives and... And use them, and, yes. Well, hopefully. Hopefully. You know, uh, uh, but Rabbi Giva did that to the nth degree, to the maximum. Uh, and he became someone who... He, and who, who made Rabbi Giva? Yeah, he had the inspiration and the support of his wife, but it was, it was him. It was him and his wife. That's what it was. Uh, and he didn't have an easy time in it, that's for sure. It wasn't like... Nothing was given to him on a silver platter. And we look at, well, he was destined for greatness, you know. Yeah, but aren't we all? And I think that's the lesson for, him, for, 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 uh, for us, is that, you know, yeah, maybe we were introduced to Judaism later on in life, or maybe we only were exposed to Torah later on, or maybe we only had uh, a little bit of a background in traditional Jewish learning. And we could say... <laughs> Come on, I, I go to class, I go to synagogue, what else do you want? From, you know, uh, the expectation is, is is greatness from each and every one of us. And Rabbi Kiva is the one who's going to put our feet to the fire, right? Uh, he, you know, this is someone who had maybe even less than we did uh, to begin with, uh, yet by, by force and determination of will, he got to places that no one else had ever gotten to. He understood things in motion didn't, which is unbelievable. Uh, no, I'm not trying to say that he's greater than Moshe, but it's just unbelievable what he achieved and what he accomplished and how crucial and vital he is for the Jewish people in continuity. And that, I think, is inspiring for us, but also it's, 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 it's going to obligate us. It, it should obligate us to try to, you know, take a lesson from Rabbi Kiva. You know, he took lessons from everything. They had a little water on, the, water on the rock. If we saw the water on the rock, would we change our lives? How nice is that? Take a picture and send it on Instagram or Facebook, right? 
Wow, look at this, Colorado right? Colorado River. You, you know, you know, we have. And that's water that just, uh, you know, just went through the Grand Canyon. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But how nice is it, right? Oh, take a picture. Beautiful, right? Well, you know. You can think about, I mean, people. You know, but how many opportunities do we have to be inspired? We have loads of opportunities, loads of and the hope is, is like Rabbi Tifa, we too will be inspired and make, and you know, and, and make a great life out of our, our out of our opportunity. I think that's a lesson, and I think that's the inspiration. Uh, of course, there's a lot more, uh, but uh, I, you know, I think we have a little bit of a picture of, of the character and the development and the accomplishments uh, and the scholarship of Rabbi Tifa and his uh, inspiration to us. And you know, I think it's fair to say that we're only here today studying Torah. We only have Torah today because of him. You know, of course, there are other people that that could be said about as well. But if he wasn't there, who knows what we would have looked at. So let's be thankful and appreciative of his dedication, determination, commitment, and, of course, his sacrifices as well. How many of you all know that I'd like to take you from him? Everyone that you know, everyone that we all know. <laughs> I mean, everyone, everyone. Disciples? Yeah, well, we know the names of his disciples, and we know, we know, we know a lot about that. Uh, but we also know that he was one who taught the Torah to the Jewish people. I look forward to seeing everyone next week. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And tell your friends. And so, yes. what are we studying this week again? Next week is the 